is Ann Geisen. Ann Geisen is located in the Aitken office for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources, and she is in charge of the Shallow Lakes program, which is which is in throughout Minnesota to be able to improve habitat for wildlife and for wild rice with throughout the state. Um, Anne has more than 20 years of experience doing this kind of work. And so we are really excited to have her join us today and talk a little bit more about the status of wild rice management in Minnesota. So welcome, Anne. I'm going to turn things over to you and uh, we can we can start seeing some of your presentation. Thanks, Amber. Can, let's see. Can you see my screen? We can indeed see your screen, Anne. Thank you. Great. So let's jump right in. Um, I'm excited to be here today to talk to folks about wild rice ecology and how it's managed by the DNR in Minnesota. Right off the bat, I want to point out that even though I'm the one, there we go, even though I'm the one that's doing the presentation today, there's a whole team of people who's who are managing wild rice in Minnesota. Um, there's DNR Shallow Lake program staff in nine offices around the state, and there's many, many area wildlife staff in 37 offices around the state. So wild rice management and work in Minnesota is definitely a team effort. Wild rice is a unique and special resource in Minnesota. Minnesota has more natural wild rice than any other state in the nation. It's declined from its historic range in Minnesota, but it is still widespread. This is a map of wild rice waters in Minnesota, and you can see that wild rice is found from the Canada border all the way down to the Iowa border. And even in western Minnesota counties, which many folks wouldn't even consider to be uh, wild rice country. In total, we have about 2100 lakes and rivers across the state. Um, but rice is most abundant in northeast Minnesota. This area here is considered the heart of the wild rice range and the top 5 counties for wild rice are right in this area. Aiken, Crow Wing, Cass, Itasca and St. Louis. It's an important resource in Minnesota for a couple of reasons. It's important for waterfowl and other wildlife. The grain provides food for resident and migrating wildlife, especially waterfowl. The plant provides nesting material in the spring and it provides brood cover in for ducks and other water birds in the summer. And the decaying straw in the fall and spring provides habitat for invertebrates. It's an, also an important food resource for people. There's a very long tradition of hand harvesting in Minnesota. And nationwide, probably the only two states where you can hand harvest wild rice are Minnesota and Wisconsin. So this is something you can't do everywhere. Rice is also very important to the Anishinaabe and Dakota tribes in Minnesota. Um, it's been a significant food source for both for generations. It is also culturally important. They see wild rice as a spirit or a being. It is more than just a plant. Um, the Anishinaabe, also known as the uh, Ojibwe or the Chippewa, it's rice is also an important part of their creation story. They used to live in the Eastern United States but the great spirit told them to migrate west until they found the food growing on the water. So they migrated to west and when they reached the Great Lakes, they knew they had found the place where they were supposed to call home. So just to clarify, the tribes manage wild rice waters within their reservation boundaries. This talk is just about how the state DNR manages wild rice. There's actually three subspecies of wild rice in Minnesota. Uh, one species is northern wild rice, and even though it's called northern, um, you'll see that it's found throughout the state. The two subspecies are Zizania palustris palustris and Zizania palustris interior. The second species and the third subspecies is southern wild rice. 
this has only been recorded in the far southeast corner of Minnesota on the Mississippi River. However, it, it, there's probably more sites than just this one. It just probably hasn't been documented. A little bit about wild rice habitat, because it doesn't grow just anywhere. It's an annual grass that grows from seed every year. It grows best in water that's a half a foot to three feet deep. It can grow in deeper water, but it tends to not do as well. The depth of a one and a half feet seems to be ideal. Um, and sites with flowing water, such as inlets and outlets, um, have better rice stands. A soft substrate seems to be preferred by rice. It does better in soft substrates, but I've also seen healthy stands of rice growing in sand. So it can grow in a variety of bottom types. pH needs to be close to neutral, which is seven. So as low as six or as high as eight, but not much outside that range. It also needs low sulfate, uh, 10 milligrams per liter or less. New plants start from seed each year, only grows from seed. It doesn't grow from a rhizome, doesn't grow from a tuber. Every plant you see started out from a seed. And those seeds need to be exposed to ne near freezing temperatures in order to germinate. And germination occurs soon after ice out. I took this photo in Aiken County around May 15th, a couple of years ago, which isn't super long after ice out, but you can see that the wild rice plants are already four inches uh, long. So it's an early plant. It, it grows earlier than other aquatic plants, which helps it, um, it keeps the rice from getting shaded out by other plants because it starts growing first. Once it sprouts from a seed, it'll grow until it reaches the surface of the water. And when it reaches the surface, it produces what's called a floating leaf. This is what's also called the floating leaf stage. And floating leaves appear in late May, mid June, depending on what part of the state you're in. During this floating leaf stage, the leaf floats on the surface of the water while the plant does some more growing. If water levels go down, the leaf floating on the surface of the water will also go down. If water levels go up, the leaf will keep floating on the surface of the water and rise with the water levels. This makes the plant very sensitive to water level changes. And if the water level goes up too high, too fast, the plant will actually be uprooted. So the plants are very sensitive in this stage. Um, again, too, if the water gets too high, if there's a big rain event, it can wipe out the entire crop. In late June, the leaves start standing or going emergent. You can see in this photo that a lot of the plants are now standing upright, but you can see these plants here are still in the floating leaf stage. They're not quite emergent yet. By July, all the plants are emergent. And in this, in an aerial view, that means a lake that's full of rice will start to look like a hay field. It's, the plants are less sensitive to water level changes at this time, but they are not completely immune. Big water level changes can still wipe out large parts of the crop. In late July, the plant will produce flowers. An individual plant has both female and male flowers. The female flowers are will produce the seeds and the male flowers will produce pollen. On an individual plant, the male flowers will ripen first and start producing pollen before the female flowers on the same plant are ready. This is to keep an individual plant from pollinating itself. The pollen from these flowers will get blown to another plant and 
to female flower that's ready. And by the time this female flower is ready, these female flowers are ready for pollen. These male flowers will be done and dying back. The seeds mature late August through September. Uh, that's also called ricing season for folks who harvest rice. The seeds on a single plant do not ripen at the same time. This is a defense mechanism for the plant. If all the seeds got ripe at once and a flock of birds came in, they could eat all the seeds and prevent any seeds from falling into the lake to grow new plants the next year. Because the seeds ripen over a staggered period, birds or other wildlife won't be able to get most of the seeds. And what that means for harvesters is that an individual water can be harvested for two to three weeks as the seeds gradually ripen throughout the lake. Rice production on an individual water will vary over time. Uh, there's kind of a rule of, you know, a four to five year period, you'll have uh, one to two great crops, one to two fair crops, one poor crop. So you can't expect great rice on a given water body every year. There's some variability due to weather events. Um, this is the same lake, two different photos. In 2004, the rice was beautiful, great rice crop. In 2016, there were a lot of storms and rain events and all the rice got uprooted or drowned out. The lake basically had no rice that year. But outside of weather, there's also variability just because rice is an annual plant and annuals do best with some disturbance. Um, one thing we found and that we consider in our management is we don't want to keep the water level too stable. If the water level is too stable for too long, perennials can take over. This is a lake in northern Minnesota. You can see the wild rice here. This is pickerel weed coming in, which is a perennial. And in this lake, we think the water level has been too stable for too long and the perennial pickerel weed is starting to take over and outcompete some of the wild rice. So whether or not to manage a wild rice water, not all rice waters need management. Um, even with the normal variability in the four to five year period, some lakes do well. They don't seem to have issues and they don't need management. For other lakes, given the normal variability, the rice doesn't do well or we identify issues that need to be fixed. And so for those rice waters, management is definitely needed. DNR Wildlife manages rice for both wildlife and rice harvesters. We manage about 150 to 250 lakes a year and the management strategies are tailored to each individual lake and what's needed. Where does the money come from? Uh, we get funding for wild rice work from a variety of sources. The Game and Fish Fund, which is um, where your hunting and fishing license dollars go, that funds a lot of staff time for wildlife personnel, including my time. I'm funded by funds from the Game and Fish account. There's the wild rice account. All money from wild rice harvesting licenses goes into a dedicated account. That money is only spent on wild rice management. Some money comes from the Minnesota State Waterfall Stamp. Waterfall hunters are required to purchase a stamp to hunt waterfall in Minnesota. It goes into a dedicated account. The money is only used for waterfall habitat projects. And sometimes those habitat projects are wild rice projects. In Minnesota, we've also been fortunate to get uh, funding from Ducks Unlimited. Since 2001, Ducks Unlimited has annually contributed money to fund wild rice work. Uh, Ducks, one of Ducks Unlimited's priorities is waterfowl habitat, and they see 
They understand that wild rice is a very important part of the waterfall habitat in Minnesota, so they have funded the work um, for over 20 years now. For specific projects on specific lakes, we've also sometimes gotten money from the LCCMR fund, which is lottery proceeds and the Outdoor Heritage Fund, which is uh, funded by the special sales tax. Common management methods that we use in Minnesota include water level management, structure modification, seeding, shoreland protection, and monitoring. Some folks don't necessarily equate monitoring as a part of management, but it's a really important part of our management methodology. To know if you need to manage something, you need to assess the current conditions and determine if there's an issue or if a fix is needed. And you get that data by doing monitoring. So I'll talk about some of these methods, uh, but not all of them. Water level management is the method that we most commonly use. This just involves keeping outlet channels clear and free flowing. It usually involves removing beavers and beaver dams. When a beaver dam is built, it raises the water level in the lake. So removing the dam lowers the water level in the lake to what should be normal and the rice does better. Also removing the dam and by not having the water level high, it reduces the rapid water level bounces that can uproot and drown out wild rice plants. Sometimes water level management is not enough. Uh, here are two photos, uh, 2008 and 2012 of the same lake. Uh, here you can see the wild rice coming in in the background. This is a good wild rice year on this lake. 2012, we had major rain events. The lake was flooded. The lake was several feet higher than normal. Um, this is me standing in front of the boardwalk. So I'm standing at about that spot. There was basically no um, wild rice in the lake in 2012. It all got uprooted or drowned out. So some that we can't control mother nature, but the things we can control, um, which includes beaver dams, sometimes it's just as simple as removing the dam. Um, this is a dam on a wild rice lake in Aiken County uh, a couple years ago. The water behind the dam was uh, about two feet higher, uh, two feet behind the dam, making the lake higher than normal. So I pulled the dam and let the water out. Water level dropped and the rice that year was beautiful. That's all it took, removing the beaver dam. Um, and we do a lot of this in Minnesota. This is our most common method. This year in 2022, we have 85 wild rice lakes under contract where we are paying trappers to remove beaver dams and trap the beaver. Another tool that we use is structure modifications. Sometimes the issue is not a high water level, it is water capacity. The outlet channel and structures need enough capacity to get large volumes of water off the lake quickly before the rice is uprooted or drowned out. Structures includes culverts. In this example, there's a really wide um, outlet channel that can handle the volume of water, but this culvert is way too small to handle the volume of water that will come through. An example of a lake where we modified the structure was, is Jaeger Lake. Um, we removed beaver dams and trapped beaver for several years, but we weren't uh, seeing the improvement in the rice that we wanted. The lake level would still get high during rain events. And looking at the outlet and the culvert, it's not hard to see why. The channel is fairly wide, but this culvert is too small for the channel. The water can't leave the lake quickly enough. You can see in this photo, the water is almost over the top of the culvert. So we put in a big concrete box culvert, uh, much larger, 
uh, can handle the capacity of water. It was completed in 2013 and rice is doing much better. Another tool that we sometimes use is seeding, but before we seed rice, um, you want to make sure that habitat conditions are good. If rice used to be in a lake and it declined or it disappeared, there's probably a habitat issue and you need to fix that habitat issue first or the seeding won't work. We have also found that seeds can remain viable in the substrate for decades. So when the habitat conditions are fixed and if there's enough seed in the bottom, the rice will often come back on its own. This is a photo of a lake we're trying to manage and we've did some work on the outlet and got the lake level lower and wild rice plants are starting to come in all on their own. We haven't done any seeding. But sometimes seeding is necessary. If there's no remnant seed source or the seed bank needs to be built up to have a larger stand or a self-sustaining stand of wild rice, then that's where we consider seeding. I'm often asked by folks um, who want to seed rice on their property what how to go about it. Um, so here are some guidelines. Seeding rate is 50 pounds of rice seed per acre of water. And you should plan to seed three years in a row to develop a self-sustaining stand. I tell folks start small, do a small area first. And if the habitat conditions are right and the rice does well, then you can look at expanding the seeding effort in future years. If it doesn't do well, you won't have wasted a lot of money. You do need a DNR permit to, if you're gonna seed rice in a public water. Um, the permit is free. It's just a way for the DNR to double check that folks aren't planting things they shouldn't. And we also recommend that you get seed that's geographically close to the planting site. So if you're gonna plant rice in Crow Wing County, try to get the seed from a water in Crow Wing County. If you can't get seed from the same county, try the, the ring of counties around it. If you can't get seed there, then maybe try the second ring of counties. I wouldn't go any farther out because any rice seed you get um, too far away just won't match the local habitat conditions where you wanna plant it. Couple other things to know about seeding. You wanna plant the seed right away after harvest. If it's not planted right away, you need to keep it wet. If, you, if the seed dries out, it won't grow and you'll have wasted any money you spent getting rice seed. Um, this is photo from a seeding project I worked on. We had close to 1100 pounds of rice seed. We couldn't plant it right away and needed to keep it wet. Well, you need kind of a large storage container to hold 1100 pounds of rice seed. And my coworker had the idea to take the two spare canoes and fill them with water and put the rice seed in that. And that worked. We we're able to keep the seed wet until we got it planted. Another thing to know is that if seed was gonna be stored over the winter for a spring planting project, you need it needs to be stored in freezing temperatures. So storing it in the 50 degree garage won't work. Um, it needs freezing temperatures for the rice to germinate. And here's an example of a seeding project uh, DNR Wildlife has done. This is Washburn Lake in Aiken County. And Washburn has always had some wild rice. And this is a you know pretty good stand along the North Shore and there's some rice here around the island. But a lot of this is shallow water where rice should be growing and isn't. In the shallow areas of the lake, a lot of the rice looks like this, just scattered plants. And we've removed the beaver and the beaver dams for several years and the rice is slowly expanding. But we think that 
the plants are getting outgrazed by swans and geese. So we need to establish a larger stand that can withstand the grazing pressure, a stand that can sustain itself. So we decided to do some seeding. Um, from lake surveys, we knew the depth of the lake. So we targeted the areas of the lake that would be shallow enough for wild rice to grow well. This part of the lake is kind of deep, too deep for rice, so we weren't going to put any there. So this purplish pink area we identified came out to 36 acres. At 50 pounds of rice per acre, that came out to 1,800 pounds of rice seed. However, 2021 was a poor year for rice or a poor year to get out. The water level wasn't high enough to get out on a lot of wild rice waters. So we did not get the 1,800 pounds of rice we wanted. We ended up getting um, only 1,100 pounds, but we went out and planted it on September 9th. And this year we're gonna monitor conditions and see how much rice comes in. And then we're planning to plant for another two years and hopefully we'll have more rice across the lake and it'll be able to sustain itself. And I also wanted to mention just a little bit about wild rice harvesting as um, a little bit of a prelude. There will be a uh, wild rice harvesting presentation as part of this webinar series uh, coming later in July. But a couple of things to note if you've thought about it or never done it, harvesting season runs from the end of August through mid-September, depending on where you are in the state. A harvesting license is required for non-tribal members. Regulations are posted on the DNR website and there's uh, you know, several regulations related to the size of the canoe and the size of your flail. So you'll wanna check those out as if you wanna prepare for racing season. Also, I tell folks every year, make sure the rice is ripe. It is illegal to harvest green rice or ripe rice that is not ripe. So you wanna make sure if you, if you try to harvest green rice, it won't fall into the boat easily and you'll also damage the plants and you'll keep rice kernels on that plant from getting right, ripe. So you're gonna be destroying the plant. So make sure that the rice is ready before you go out there and try to harvest. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Amber, and maybe there's time for questions. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. And we did have quite a few questions come in. It seems like most people are interested in learning more about potentially planting wild rice on their own property. Um, so I'll just kind of start asking some of these. Uh, the first one came in from Jill. Jill is wondering if wild rice will ever grow on a pond where there's minimal water movement. And in particular, just kind of wondering how much water movement is needed um, for successful wild rice growth. I haven't seen um, any data on how much water movement is needed. Um, people have, it has done okay in ponds. Realize that if you plant it in a pond with no water movement, it might not be as thick or as dense as a lake where there is water movement. So I would say, sure, go ahead and try it. Um, again, start small. I mean, I don't know how big the pond is, but I wouldn't seed the whole thing. You know, start in a small section and see if the plants do well. And knowing the depth of your pond would be helpful. Um, the parts of the pond that are, you know, one and a half feet or less, or, you know, maybe two feet or less, the rice will do better. If your pond is 10 feet deep, don't even put the seed in those areas. You. Um, Ellie is actually wondering if the DNR has a list of wild rice lakes anywhere on our website or if that resource is available um, anywhere throughout the state of Minnesota. Yeah, actually it is on the website. Um, if you scroll down to the bottom, there is a link and it says something like list of statewide 
Wild Rice Waters, and it'll take you to a spreadsheet. Um, we're hoping to have that, you know, somehow connected to GIS in the future, but right now you'd have to look up a water on the spreadsheet, but the list has um, water ID numbers. And if you take that ID number and you type that into Lake Finder, that will pull up the location of the rice water on a map. You and and while we were talking here, while you were talking, I I went ahead and posted the link to that that management website in the chat so that everyone can access that. And there are a lot of additional resources and links at the very bottom of that web page. Um, so in terms of moving over a little bit more towards uh, towards management, um, Christy, uh, or sorry, Krista was wondering if there's a critical time of the year when beaver dams have to be removed, and and does it potentially affect the breeding cycle of that particular group of beavers? Um, critical time to remove it for rice is early spring. Um, Yesterday, I was working on wild right or talking to trappers who are starting to scout the lakes to remove the dams. You want the water lower in the spring as the plants start to come up. Um, so before the floating leaf stage or during the floating leaf stage, you want the dams gone before then. It um, doesn't affect the, the the beavers have already. Um, the mama beavers have already had kits, so the kits will be living in the lodge. So the water level will be lower and the um, the yearlings will be kicked out soon to go find their own place. So yeah, the mama beaver and the kits may have to move on if the water level goes too low. And it doesn't, they'll still be able to live there. It'll just be harder for them to find food or float food food and they might decide to go find a better spot to set up house. Yeah, and we also had a, we also had an individual question about one of the pictures in your slides and and to me it looks like it looks to me like the management that's being done is that someone's removing part of a beaver dam. Do do they remove the dam in its entirety or do they just open up a small enough channel to be able to let the water through? We remove the dam in its entirety. So the next question comes from Bill, and Bill is wondering um, the the wild rice that's commercially grown in Minnesota and in the region is it is it one that came from a native seed or a native species? Yes, it was developed from natural wild rice or wild wild rice. They got the seed, you know, from a wild rice lake, and then they bred it to have different traits. Um, for example, wild wild rice, as I mentioned, has a staggered maturing process. It doesn't get ripe all at the same time. If you're growing wild rice, if you're farming wild rice and you want to harvest it, you don't want to have to go out there every day and harvest part of your crop. You want get ripe all at once so you can harvest it all at the same time. So one of the traits they bred it for is that it um, ripens all at the same time. Another trait they bred it for, um, wild wild rice falls off the stalk when it's ripe. That's a problem if you're growing a crop, you want it to hang onto the stalk until you can go out there and harvest it. So they also bred it where it won't fall off the stalk. But it's genetically the same as wild rice in, you know, natural lakes or rivers. They just bred it uh, for different traits over many years. So a few more questions. Uh, I'm going to combine a couple here from from Bill and Aaron, just in questions in terms about potentially planting um, planting their own wild rice. Um, you talked a little bit about the best time to do it, you know, right after you harvest it. Do you do you have any additional recommendations on um, on whether or not to do it right away in the fall, or if you if you can wait until the spring? And also just an additional question about when you're storing it in water, do you need to store it in the same lake? water or can you use any kind of water from the hose in your yard? 
Uh, no, it, as far as water, it does not have to be water from the lake. Um, the bags of rice we had in the canoe, we just for the canoes, we just filled the canoes up with the hose from the office. It just needs to be kept wet. As far as timing, um, fall is better. Fall is easier for many logistical reasons. If you can plant it right away, you don't even need to keep it wet. Um, if you keep it wet, it will start to smell. I've been told this is because of, um, I don't know if it's a bacterial process or mold, but it will stink like a hog farm. So the longer you have it sitting, the longer you're gonna have to put up with the smell. I actually like warn my coworkers at the office, hey, realize it's gonna smell out there by the garage. This is why it's only gonna be a couple of days. So I really can't imagine a feasible way to like do that in your backyard till spring. Um, I know some people have tried it in the spring, but I would say if you can do it in the fall, it's easier for many reasons. Excellent advice. I, I, I can't imagine that most people would wanna put up with that smell for, for a very, very long time. Um, in terms of in terms of potentially seeding, is there an ideal depth of water to kind of start at? Again, the rice seems to do best in one and a half feet of water. I wouldn't go less than a half a feet. It needs the rice stalks are kind of buoyant, and the water helps support them and helps them stand up, especially when they get really tall. If the water is too shallow the plants might fall over. So deeper than a half a foot, um, I would say a half a foot to two feet would be the ideal place to start. So Stacy is wondering a little bit about um, the management aspects of floating bogs and if there are any things that need to be done um, when floating bogs start to move around and wipe out stands of rice. Is that is that something you manage or is that just something that you that you deal with? That is something that wildlife tries to manage. Um, you know, and on some lakes it happens once in a while, but on a couple of important rice lakes in um, Itasca County, Grand Rapids work area, it's been happening kind of regularly where they've been, yeah, trying to, and we've been trying to come up with solutions and maybe it's going out with a cookie cutter to chop up those chunks of bog. So they'll actually go down the outlet channel and not wipe out the stand of rice. If the chunk of bog fl uh, floats to the outlet and blocks the water flow, it'll have the same effect as a beaver dam. So sometimes we've had to uh, contract heavy equipment like a backhoe to come in and break up the um, bog. On a couple lakes, they've tried to put in um, a barrier with a telephone cable to keep the bog from drifting into the stand of rice and wiping it out. So yeah, it's something we've we'd have to deal with and we're trying to come up with better solutions all the time and some lakes there are no easy answers. But yeah, it's definitely a problem and something we're trying to address. You. Um, we have, I guess, a few more questions from people interested in, in wild rice uh, planting. Mary's wondering if it would make sense to try and plant wild rice on a very small one acre pond, or is that, or is that just uh, too small of a habitat? No, there's no really size requirement for habitat. You know, one acre is not too small. And if you could get, you know, half an acre of wild rice in your one acre pond, that would certainly attract some wildlife. When when we're thinking about attracting wildlife, you know, what as you're in all of these ponds, uh, you know, what are what are the primary primary species that you're seeing that become attracted that are that get drawn into these wild acre, wild rice areas? Well, I mean. So I've been all over the state. So, you know, in different parts of the state, different habitat types, not to say that you're gonna see all of these critters in 
your wild rice stand, but all kinds of ducks, ringneck ducks especially, seem to key in on wild rice lakes. Um, swans, I don't know if I've ever seen a wild rice lake without at least one pair of swans, usually with a brood. Um, Sora rails, they're a secretive marsh bird that people don't often see. You'll usually hear them before you see them. But I have seen more wild, more Sora rails harvesting wild rice than, you know, any other time I've spent in the field. Um, yeah, so Sora rails are kind of considered a wild rice bird. Also green herons. Um, yeah, those are the that will come to mind right now. But again, you see all kinds of ducks. And there's one lake, one wild rice lake. I try to check. I check for waterfall every spring when the migration's coming through. And last year, the one day there were 54 swans. There were 120 ringnecks. There were some greater scop. There were some gadwalls, some mallards, some wood ducks. Um, yeah, just all kinds of birds. That's great to hear. Um, Bill actually had kind of a, an extension of that question. Bill was wondering, do you have any thoughts or estimates on on like what percentage or what part of the wild rice that you that you plant each year that actually ends up getting harvested by by waterfowl? No, I I haven't seen any numbers on that. I've also been asked the quest a similar question um, relative to what harvesters collect and how much is left how much seed is left to fall to grow new plants the next spring and i've seen some statistics about how many seeds are on a single wild rice plant but no nobody really knows how much is you know collected in harvesters canoes versus how much falls versus how much is eaten by birds um It'd be a cool study, but it'd be incredibly extensive and complicated. So, you know, along along those terms of sort of monitoring and kind of being able to to watch these the these you know these stands of wild rice growing, how much do you rely on Minnesota citizens to help with that monitoring, or is that something is that something that's just done by by a small team at the DNR? You know, anecdotal information from landowners or citizens is helpful. We, there's a lake where we're, rice disappeared and we're trying to restore it. And no one can pinpoint exactly when it disappeared. We have surveys that, you know, there was good rice in the fort, you know, in 1940 something, and we have a survey from 1968 rice across the lake, but talking to, trying to figure out, okay, when did rice disappear? And it's been talking to local people, the local, the guy who's lived in the area forever who told me that, you know, in 1979, when there was a drought, there was rice across the lake. It's running into a harvester who told me he last harvested it in the 1980s. It's, I met a guy at the access who he happened to, I was checking on the lake and he happened to pull in. He, he hadn't hunted it since he was a kid, you know, when there were a ton of ducks. And I asked him, okay, when, you know, not trying to age you, sir, but about, you know, when was that? And, you know, he told me, well, yeah, this many decades ago was when I last saw ducks. So stuff like that helps us pinpoint maybe when the lake changed. As far as official surveys right now, um, Shallow Lakes program, we do all of the surveys on these lakes and maybe in the future we'll be able to develop a you know a citizen monitoring program where information can get entered online and get easily maintained but we're not there yet thank you for that that's great um, Corey had a, a question about if he, if you know of any places where, uh, where Corey might be able to buy rice seeds for planting or is that something that individuals have to harvest there's a couple of ways to get seed, and one of the easiest ways is to harvest 
it yourself or talk to a harvester. If you have friends who harvest and say, hey, you know, I want to plant this at my place in Crow Wing County. Do you harvest? Amber, do you harvest rice anywhere in Crow Wing County? And you say, well, sure, I go to Lake X and Y and great. And so I'll buy it from you. And I know that um, I know where it's coming from. I know when it's coming from Lake X and Y. I know when I'm going to get it because you might call me Monday and say you're, you know, you can deliver it to me on Wednesday. And I'm like, okay, I'll plan to plant it on Thursday. So harvest it yourself or talk to friends who harvest or, um, you know, find harvesters. Otherwise, uh, there aren't a lot of sources for local seed. Um, one thing you might try, contact the tribes. Um, they may have rice seed to sell if you contact them early enough and let them know how much you want. Um, for our DNR seeding projects, I'm usually sending emails to harvesters I know and asking if they're harvesting in a certain area and if they can, you know, get seed from these sources because I have a planting project in this county. But yeah, sometimes it's hard to find. But if they, so, someone wants to follow up with me um, after this, my email address is on the website uh, under the Shell Lakes program. I can uh, maybe send them some names and contact info. Thank you. Like most things, it seems it seems to be a lot about networking. <laughs> very, very much so. So um, Nicola also sent us uh, an individual question, and it seems like Nicola maybe has done some harvesting or has some experience. Um, Nicola's wondering what what can you tell us about ghost rice? Is it just not pollinated? Um, and just made a notation that empty hulls have been a significant issue in the past in some of the basins that she's been on. Yes, empty hulls. Um, you go out to harvest rice and you knock it into the boat, but if you break it open, there's no seed in there. Yes, it didn't get pollinated. And the usual cause, um, I should back up, rice is, pollen is carried by wind. So if there's a major wind event that blows all the pollen away, the female flowers won't get pollinated. Also big storm events uh, that can wash away all the pollen before the female flowers get pollinated. Yeah, that's the cause of empty hulls. So Bill also had a question about um, it, it just noting back to, to some history that that he knows of that years ago when commercial rice farming was getting started in his particular county of Clearwater County, um, he had heard that they were putting rice seed in clay balls. Um, and he was just wondering if that's still done and if there's any benefit to that seeding method. Yeah, I've heard of that as a seeding method or I've read some stuff that recommends you make a mud ball. You take the seed and mix it up with mud and then toss it out into the water. And the only thing, the only possible thing I can think of is that your aim is better, that if you want to get the rice into a certain part of the lake that throwing a somewhat heavy mud ball is easier than broadcasting rice. But for the most part, it's unnecessary. If you think about how a natural wild rice water reseeds itself, the kernel gets ripe on the plant and when it's ripe, it falls off. And if a kernel is ripe and the, the hull is full, it's not, you know, a, an empty hull, it will sink to the bottom right away. And the rice kernel also has an on on it that helps drill the seed down into the substrate. So the way nature does it is the seed just falls to the bottom. So it's as easy as just broadcasting seed like you saw in some of the photos. Um, we just take scoops and throw it out there and the seed sinks. So, 
I don't see any more questions as of right now. Uh, we still have quite a few people that are that are watching. So if anyone else has any additional questions, I'd, I'd encourage everyone to to throw any last minute questions there in our Q and A feature. That'll help us track them very easily. Um, I did have a, you know one additional question for you, Anne. In in terms of you had mentioned that you know obviously weather events and and high rain events have a pretty drastic effect on on wild rice in the state of Minnesota. And, you know, a lot of the climate change models that we are seeing for the state of Minnesota are predicting much heavier rain events. Is that something that you consider in your work or something that um, that you have great concern for? Yes, climate change is a big concern for some of the couple of the reasons you mentioned, the big rain events, and we may already be starting to see some of those effects. Um, I mentioned that in a four to five year period, an individual rice water will have a couple great years, up at least one poor year. We're seeing more poor years than what's normal in a four to five year period. And a lot of that, yeah, you know, crops getting wiped out, wiped out from major storm events. Um, instead of getting you know, all day shower, you get the major th thunderstorm, the flooding, the lake level comes up a foot, the plants get drowned out. It seems like we're seeing that more often. Besides the more intense rain events, other climate change concerns, um, wild rice seed needs to be exposed to freezing temperatures to germinate. And if winters keep getting warmer, the rice seeds won't germinate. I'm not sure how to fix that or how to address that on individual lakes, it may mean that rice may only be present, you know, in northern Minnesota or the northern U.S. where the winters stay cold. Um, warmer summers can also lead to um, brown spot, a fungal disease that can wipe out wild rice and other uh, fungal conditions or increase other folks also think warmer weather brings an increase in rice worms. Um, so yeah, there's also disease and pest issues that can affect the wild rice because of climate change. So yeah, major concern on what it might do to rice. And then it, along those same lines as well, um, are there anything that we as citizens of Minnesota can help to do to um, also prevent the threat of aquatic invasive in species and, and what that might do to wild rice, wild rice production? Some wild rice lakes are kind of remote and they don't necessarily get a lot of boat traffic until harvesting season. So for a lot of folks, I think it's under the radar. I think they look at a wild rice lake and don't think there's a concern for an invasive species. So folks, whether you're paddling the lake or you're harvesting on the lake, you need to be as vigilant as if that's, you know, the busiest public access you ever saw. So pick all the plants off your boat, drain all the water, dry stuff before you go to another water, know what species you know, invasive species may be out there. And if you see something that looks odd, report it to the DNR right away so we can, you know, hopefully get a handle on it before it spreads. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. I'm just taking a last look here to see if we have any additional questions that came in. People are people are super excited about this conversation. Um, Amy did have a, a last minute question that came in um, and is wondering if there are any contaminants of concern that the seed is more susceptible to um, and and if the DNR does any monitoring for any of those potential contaminants. Um, sulfate is an issue for wild rice waters. Um, a few years ago, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency was attempting to revise the sulfate standard. And as part of that, they paid for like four research projects. And the research showed several findings that it wasn't necessarily specifically the sulfate that was the problem, but it was the sulfate being converted to sulfide. So when we do, when Shallow Lakes does surveys, we collect a water sample and one of the uh, parameters we have it analyzed for is sulfate. 
um, also pH. Other than that, we don't have any specific information about specific contaminants negatively impacting wild rice. And finally, it looks like um, we got a kind of a behind the scenes question here from Paul and uh, uh, Paul is just saying uh, that there's only a handful of lakes in southern Minnesota that appear to support hot wild rice, um, but the extent of the plant was historically larger in that region. Um, are there any efforts to improve the stands in southern Minnesota or to augment habitat in those former rice areas? I don't know of any specific projects to expand the rice, but I do know the area wildlife manager in Owatonna, Janine Vorland, she considers it a core part of her job to maintain what rice is left. So yeah, she's making sure that lake surveys on those rice waters are being done regularly. And in the heavily ag part of the state, it can be hard to manage plants in lake because it's not just what's going on in the lake, it's also what's going on in the watershed. But I can say that Janine does her darndest to maintain what is left. Great, that's wonderful to know that that there are people all throughout the state of Minnesota that are that are working on you know different conditions and different concerns um, you know to keep every to keep this resource at to its greatest extent possible in all of the different regions. So, well, I we're getting close to the end of our time today, and I want to thank you so much for this conversation. It's been fascinating to learn more about wild rice, and we've had some incredible questions and people interested in learning more and maybe even planting or harvesting some of their own. Um, I know that you mentioned that we are going to be holding an additional conversation about wild rice harvesting. Um, that is going to be in our new summer series for the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship. Um, and so we'll be posting that uh, registration for the, those summer sessions uh, in the coming weeks. Um, so if you want to check back on the Moss website, um, we'll be able to get you registered for that session if you're interested in learning more. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about who will be presenting on July 13th and, and what they'll be talking about? Uh, yeah, uh, Nicholas Snavely is the Assistant Area Wildlife Manager in Sauk Rapids. But Nicholas is also harvested wild rice for many years. Um, I'm not sure how many years, so I don't want to sell him short. But and I also know he's taken uh, many new folks out and introduced them to harvesting. So I asked him and he agreed to deliver that presentation. That's wonderful. And and thanks again for, for offering that extension. Uh, for those of you that are interested, we will be posting more registration information for the, the new summer series um, of this program uh, in the coming weeks. So we encourage you to check back to the website and, and start getting registered for those things. You know, as we head out today, um, if you're joining us next week, we're going to be doing some fun stuff in preparation for the fishing opener. We're going to be uh, talking to some DNR staff about their favorite top secret lures and how to use them. So if you're interested in that topic, we hope that you'll join us. Um, for those of you that may be interested in doing some bear hunting this fall, uh, just a quick reminder that the lottery for a license application or application lottery application for a license is actually the deadline for that is this Friday, May 6th. Um, so you might wanna look into that if you're interested in any bear hunting this fall. And we have some exciting fishing events coming up in the state in the next couple of weekends. Uh, this coming weekend is Take a Mom Fishing Weekend. So we encourage you to get outside with your moms around Mother's Day um, and do some fishing on your local lakes. And the, the game fish uh, fishing opener for most game fish in the state of Minnesota is coming up on Saturday, May 14th. Um, and we're hoping for some warmer weather to get some ice out on those northern lakes and excited for that uh, annual event uh, to be coming up once again. So I want to thank you once again, Anne, for this conversation today. It was really wonderful to have you joining us from Aiken. And uh, I think we are going to head back into our little uh, back room, our little practice room. We want to thank everyone for joining us today. And if you want to see parts of this again, we will be posting it to our website in the coming weeks. Thank you all. We hope you have a wonderful day.